Are your patients eating more meat on ketogenic diets? It's time to have our questions answered by the U.S. beef industry. Welcome to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm dietitian Kathy King. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Place. She is the Senior Director of Sustainable Beef Production Research at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and we're talking about the U.S. cattle industry. Sarah, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Kathy. As a dietitian, I'm in a profession where many members are vegan or vegetarian, and others love their red meat, so I've heard lots of discussion. Understanding that the majority of Americans eat meat, I would like listeners to know more about the U.S. cattle industry. Sarah, what is the economic impact of beef production in the U.S., and is the U.S. the largest producer in the world? Yeah, so actually U.S. is the largest beef producer in the world, even though we don't have the most cattle in the world, so we can come back to that issue. But in terms of economic impact, there are about 720,000 beef producers in the United States. Most of those operations are family-owned. And so just to give you a little bit of frame of reference, that's about a third of U.S. farms. And if we look at the whole economic impact of the beef industry, we generate about 2.1 million jobs in the U.S. economy and about $165 billion of economic activity that's added back to the U.S. economy. Boy, that it does have a large impact, doesn't it? What do you mean when you say sustainable beef production? I know people who are upset about the carbon footprint and the water needs of raising cattle. Can you address those concerns? Sure thing. So when we talk about sustainability in the beef industry, the way we define it is safe and nutritious beef production while focusing on economic viability, environmental stewardship, and social responsibility. So in more plain language, really what that means is our producers are focused on taking care of the land, the animals, being a good neighbor and a community member, and of course, trying to make a profit and be able to stay in business because that's key in terms of actually being a sustainable operation is you have to be able to stay in business. (laughs) Stay in business, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, of course, obviously the same whether we're talking about beef producers or any other business owner in, in the U.S. So when we think about sustainability, really what it comes down to is economics, the environment, and social issues. But the issues that you raise, the environmental issues of, say, carbon and water footprints definitely are something that we see probably the most attention to. But it's always important to keep in mind that when we think about sustainability, it really is about balancing those three areas together, not just about the environment. But with that said, we think about footprints, a little bit of context about how those are calculated. Typically, they're done by looking at the whole life cycle of a product, and so in this case, a beef. And so that when I talk about life cycle, what that means is, you know, we take into account everything that goes into the production of feed for the animals and then any impacts from the animals themselves. And then through processing the meat itself, packaging, transportation, all the way to the consumer, that would be a full life cycle assessment. So for things like water, um, when people hear about water footprint, one thing we just always want to provide more context for is most of the water that is associated with beef production is actually embedded in the feed, if you will. So most of the feed, 95 plus percent of the water footprint of beef is actually associated with feed production. So you'll hear estimates that are pretty wide ranging for beef in terms of gallons of water required per pound of beef. So, you know, anywhere from less than 400 gallons to over 2,000 gallons of water associated per pound of beef. And a lot of that variation is kind of twofold in terms of why there's such a wide range. One is the methodology that's used by scientists when they calculate water footprints. This is going into the weeds a little bit, but um, there's different types of water that are actually accounted for in water footprint analyses. And you may be thinking different types of water. What does that mean? The two major categories when we think about water footprints in agriculture are blue water, which is all surface and groundwater. So that would be mostly water that's associated with irrigation or any sort of drinking water from the cattle themselves. And then there's green water, which is essentially precipitation. So any water that's in snow or rainfall that falls on the ground that is grazed by cattle or associated with crops that are grown to feed them, that would be considered green water. 
So sometimes those high analyses or high estimates that you hear for the water footprint of beef are because green water is associated with that water footprint analysis. So that's important because most of the cattle's life is spent grazing pastures, what we call rangelands, especially out here in the western United States. And so there may be many acres that a cattle that cattle are, you know, roaming across when they're grazing. And in some of these analyses, all the water that falls on that land is associated with beef production, which of course that water will fall <laughs> from the sky whether there's beef cattle there or not. So just a little bit more context for water footprints. The other thing, you know, I'm kind of going on on this answer, but the other thing that's important is same with, with carbon footprints or really any of these footprints, whether it's associated with beef or any other product, especially in agriculture, is really every time you go to the grocery store and you pick up a package of beef, every piece of beef has its own distinct water and carbon footprint because you know, it's not cookie cutter in the United States how agriculture works, right? It depends on the region where the cattle came from, the feedstuffs that they were fed, if those were irrigated or not. So a given piece of beef may have a different, or each pound of beef, if you will, will have a slightly different water footprint from one to the next, even though most analyses or most things you read in the media just give a single number. There is a lot of variation there. And that's part of the research that we do is looking at that variation, understanding what it is and saying, okay, well, how can we get better over time in terms of what are some of those things that allow some producers to produce beef with a lower carbon footprint or lower water footprint? I appreciate that. Could you explain what is meant by ruminant upcycle protein? What does that mean? Sure, sure. So kind of related to the carbon footprint of beef, which, you know, we do analyses at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. There are many analyses that are out there in the published literature that beef does have a higher carbon footprint when you look at greenhouse gas emissions per pound of product that are produced. And a big reason why that is, is because cattle are what we call ruminant animals. And so ruminant animals, they're different than, say, you and I in terms of our digestive system. Uh, ruminants like cattle and sheep and goats and there's wild animals like deer, bison are specialized in terms of their stomach instead of just one compartment actually has four compartments. And the largest of those compartments is called the rumen and that's why they're called ruminant animals. So these animals are specialized because in that stomach compartment, in that what we call the four stomach of these creatures, they have trillions of microorganisms that live in that compartment. And so those microorganisms allow them to take grass or hay or other things that you and I can't eat and actually break it down into the products that they can use. And the way they do that is all those microbes ferment the actual feed that the animals eat. And so just like fermentation in in your, your beer, your wine, right, you get a lot of CO2 that gets produced. And there's also methane gas that gets produced. And methane is a greenhouse gas. It's 28 times more potent at trapping heat in your atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. Again, that's a big reason why beef's carbon footprint tends to be higher is this natural methane that gets produced. And then about once a minute, the animals will belch, essentially belch out that methane. So if you've heard about cow gas, it's actually, it actually comes out the front end of the animal, not the back end of the animal in terms of those emissions. So this all comes back to this upcycling concept because as those microbes are breaking down those feeds, again, those feeds are really what they're consuming is not in competition with human food. It's stuff that we can't eat. So by upcycling, what we mean is they take things of lower value like grass and they upgrade the amino acids, the proteins that are in those plants to a higher quality form that's available to us in the form of beef. For like grain finished beef in the United States, which is most of the beef produced, even though those animals are grain finished and we think about them eating a lot of corn, corn is actually less than 10% of what they eat over their entire lifetime in terms of the total amount of feed they consume. So ultimately what they do is they take for every one pound of human edible protein that these grain finished cattle will eat, they'll return in the form of beef 1.19 pounds of human edible protein back. And so what that means is they actually make 19% more protein than they consume. 
So that's what we mean by upcycling, is they're actually producing more human edible protein than they eat. And so that's really key from a sustainability standpoint, because a lot of our interest in this topic is due to the fact that we have a growing world population, and we know we got to produce more with less. We only have one planet Earth, and so ruminant animals like cattle allow us to essentially expand the the land base that we have available for food production by grazing, and they allow us to take feedstuffs, again, like grass or what we would essentially call plant leftovers from the human food industry or from the biofuels industry and turn it into high-quality protein. And just, I know I've gone on a bit on this answer, but just one more point on that is sometimes people don't realize how integrated livestock agriculture is with plant agriculture. So, for example, wheat milling produces a product called wheat mids that get fed back to livestock, to cattle. Here in Colorado, where I'm at right now, we have a large uh, sugar beet industry. And so beet pulp, that's a byproduct of producing sugar from sugar beets or the tops of the beets, the green part of those plants, those will get fed back to livestock too. So plants and animal agriculture are really tied together in the United States, which is a good thing because we're essentially, again, we're recycling and upcycling nutrients through our bioeconomy, if you will. Sarah, we don't hear about contamination of meat much anymore, except undercooked hamburger. What safeguards are in place to reduce illness in cattle and contamination of beef during processing? Yeah, so food safety is really the top priority for cattle farmers and ranchers and really anybody that's in the supply chain producing beef for human consumption. So a big reason why is because of the investment that cattle farmers and ranchers have made in safety programs and in research, especially since 1993, we've invested, cattle producers have invested over $30 million in safety research and looking at how we can intervene along the supply chain, both what we would call pre-harvest with animals themselves, making sure they're as healthy as possible, and post-harvest in what we call packing plants and along the the production chain in terms of reducing any risk for pathogen contamination. So that's been a major focus and investment of the industry. It's just the right thing to do, and it's, it's just important because, you know, our producers consume beef from the grocery store as well and feed it to their families, and so we're all very invested in making sure beef is as safe as it can be. You're listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm dietitian Kathy King, and I'm speaking with Dr. Sarah Place, researcher at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and we're talking about the U.S. cattle industry. Sarah, there seems to be a growing public interest in natural, grass-fed, and no antibiotics. What do we need to know about these terms and the use of growth promoters and antibiotics? Yeah, great question. So, We have lots of different choices when you go to the beef case, and it can be a little confusing or overwhelming in terms of what all these different terms mean. So you mentioned a few of them. So just a little bit of background before I go into that of just like what what is the typical beef production in the United States? Just so people know, most all cattle are going to be grain-finished cattle, but most of those, the lives of those animals is actually spent on grass. So we have different segments of the beef industry. The first we call the cow-calf segment, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's all the mother cows that have calves once per year. And those calves will be with their mothers until weaning, and they'll be, uh, you know, six to ten months of age before they, they leave that first part of their life. And while they're there, they're going to be consuming, obviously, their mother's milk, but also grass and hay and other feeds that we call forages. So they're really grass-fed, if you will, at the beginning of their life, all all animals in the beef system. From there, they can either go directly to what we call a feed yard or a feed lot, or they can go into a part of the industry we call the stalker segment, where they'll consume more grass, and it just depends on where they are in the country and you know, if we're in a drought year or not, how long or how many of those animals will go to that stalker segment of the industry. And so that feed yard segment of the industry is just at the end of the animal's life. So they'll typically spend four to six months of their lifetime in a feed yard. And that's where they'll actually consume a grain-based diet. It's not all corn that they eat. It'll be somewhere between 50 and 80 percent corn grain, and the rest will be some of those plant leftovers I mentioned earlier and hay that they'll be fed. So I give you all that background to say 
what is actually the difference between these different labeled beasts, right, if you will. So grass-fed or grass-finished is when an animal has eaten grass its entire life. So it's a little bit confusing, again, because truly all beef is grass-fed at some point in its life. But we typically think about that label meaning its entire life. But just an FYI to people, that actually doesn't mean they didn't spend time in a feed yard because we do have parts of the country, like if you're in the northeastern United States, obviously there's a lot of months out of the year where there's no green grass growing. And so sometimes those animals will be housed in a pen and they'll be consuming grass or in the form of hay, but they won't be grazing. So just an FYI there, that doesn't necessarily mean they were truly grazing their entire life. It just depends on where they were raised. And those animals that are grass finished, they could be given antibiotics when they're sick, or they could be given a growth promoting hormone implant. That doesn't necessarily mean they weren't given that either just because they're grass finished. There are labels like natural that you mentioned, and natural really refers to the fact that those animals never received antibiotics and never received any sort of growth promoting hormone either. That's the major difference between those label claims. Now, they could be natural grass-fed, right? In that case, those animals would be fed all forage, and then they would never receive antibiotics or hormones. So it can get a little confusing because some of these labels will overlap with one another. And there's also, you know, if, if people, are, people want to consume beef that has never been treated with antibiotics or growth promoters, so your, your options really are natural beef, or USDA certified organic would also never have been treated with antibiotics or growth hormones. And really the distinction between organic and natural comes down to the feed that the animals consume. So with organic beef production, the feed itself has to be certified organic that is fed to the cattle. And that's the major difference between organic and natural. So it can get a little bit confusing. Some of these, again, these labels overlap, but you do have lots of choices when you go to the beef case in terms of choosing how that animal was raised or the production system that you're buying from, essentially. The more organic or more natural will definitely make the price higher. Is that right? Yeah, typically the price is higher for those products. And part of that is, again, coming back to the production system itself. So for organic, typically organic feed costs more for the producers. And so that higher cost of production is essentially passed on to you as the consumer if you purchase that product. And the same thing with natural. By not using the growth promoter products in the production system, the cost of production tends to be higher for that product. Um, and again, so that kind of gets passed along to the consumer in that case. I understand that beef and beef products are leaner today. Is this true? Yes, actually, it's pretty dramatic, the changes that have taken place in beef in terms of leanness. So just for example, in 1989, we had six lean cuts that were USDA certified lean cuts from beef animal. And in 2013, that went up to 38 USDA certified lean cuts. So we, we always kind of joke we have more lean cuts of beef than there are parts of the chicken, <laughs> essentially. And that change has really taken place because of, you know, there's been consumer interest in having a lower fat content. And so the beef industry has responded over the last several decades to meet that demand. Part of it is animal genetics. So producers breeding animals to have lower amounts of, of fat and the way they feed animals has changed to, to accommodate that. And then a lot of it happens at both the packing plants and at the grocery store when meat cutters are making those cuts and they trim off a lot of the external fat off of those, those different cuts. So it's kind of been a whole supply chain focus on meeting what consumers want. And so we've just seen a, just a reduction in the total fat content of, of beef and the amounts of saturated fat that is that is present in beef. With the grass-fed and the organic, there are a few nutrients that are higher, I understand, just because of the fact that their feed has had more of the omega-3s and such like that in them. Is that right? Or am I asking a question that's not in your area? Yeah, no, I mean, that is, it is a little outside of my area, but we do have lots of materials on that. And, and there are differences that you can detect between grass and grain-finished beef. It's mainly on the fatty acid profile of the beef itself. So grass finished, as you might expect, because those animals are eating grass, they tend to have a little bit lower total fat content 
you know, we have an infographic that essentially breaks it out of saying, you know, you're going to bet for a serving size 5.2 grams of fat from grain finish and 2.9 from grass finish. And there's a little bit different in the fatty acid profile, but when it comes right down to it, I mean, both are great choices in terms of nutrition. And the difference between the two, sometimes people talk about, you know, the omega-3 content of grass-finished beef. It is numerically higher, but you would just have to eat so much of it to make make a difference from a nutrition standpoint. You know, a lot of our, our nutritionists on staff essentially say, if you, if you need to get your omega-3s, you should probably eat salmon or flaxseed or one of those other foods that's really a good source of omega-3s. You're not going to consume beef necessarily, whether it's grass or grain finished for those fatty acids. Sarah, if listeners want to know more information about the beef industry, what website can they go to? If you remember the ad campaign from the 90s, the Beef It's What's For Dinner, we have a website that's called beefitswhatsfordinner.com. And that website has all information that you would ever want to know about beef. So from recipes to nutritional information. And then if you're interested in more answers about some of these questions about how beef is raised, we have a section right on the homepage of that website. It's called Raising Beef, and it answers a lot of those questions about what actually takes place in the United States in terms of how beef is raised and cared for. And so definitely check out that website. Again, it's beefitswhatsfordinner.com. Sarah, thank you for bringing us this beef insight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Our guest has been Dr. Sarah Place. She's the Senior Director of Sustainable Beef Production Research at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. We've been talking about the U.S. cattle industry. I'm Kathy King, Registered Dietitian, and you've been listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at ReachMD.com featuring podcasts of this and other series. And thank you for listening.